Aloha, and welcome to another edition of Living Legend Lawyers, brought to you by the Hawaii State Bar Association and ThinkTech Hawaii. We're very happy to be here and to talk with uh, some of our three-digit attorneys, and by that I don't mean they have uh, only three fingers or three toes. These are individuals who, who have bar numbers with only three digits in them. This is part of Hawaii State Bar Association's 3D series. Um, memorializing the careers of our uh, bar members with three digits. We're very happy to have with us uh, two attorneys here in the studio and one attorney via Skype. So let me walk through and introduce you. We'll first start to my immediate left uh, with Jim Levitt. Bar number is 939. He's a graduate of the University of Michigan Law School and originally came to Hawaii with the U.S. Uh, Marine Corps uh, JAG program in 1968, was assigned to Pearl Harbor. When he was discharged from the military, he took a position with the Public Defender's Office, and uh, a year later joined four others to, to form a new firm, and then sometime about seven years after that left to start a new practice. That grew into the current Levitt, Yamani and Soldner, that has been active uh, and practicing uh, firm here in Hawaii for over 30 years. Jim, it's great to have you here. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Just to his immediate left is Bernie Bays. He happens to be also my, uh, my law partner. His bar number is 969. He graduated from Stanford Law School. He came over and worked as an associate and a partner at Paget Greeley and Mar Marimoto, and left to be a partner at Carl Smith Wichman Case, where he served as a co-administrator for the Honolulu office, as well as a section leader for the real estate and business litigation section. He then left uh, there to found uh, what is now Bayes, Lung, Rose, and Homa, the current firm in which he serves as, as uh, the main, uh, principal name partner. Bernie, great to have you. Thank you. And joining us via Skype is uh, Brooke Hart. His bar number is 723. He graduated from Columbia Law School uh, was with the Public Defender's Office from 1970 to 1972. Uh, was then with Hart, Sherwood, Levitt, Blanchfield, uh, and Hart Hall from 1972 to 1980, uh, and then with Hart and Wolf before starting his own law offices of Brooke Hart, and he's been there ever since. Brooke, it's great to have you here as well. Thank you very much, Craig. So we'll get the attention off of me and my introductions and start talking to our living legends. And let, let me start, uh, Brooke, with you. Tell us a little bit how you started the practice of law in Hawaii. What what got you going here and, and what was that like at that time? Well, here's what happened. Before we started the Public Defender's Office, and I was the first state and federal public defender for Hawaii, I was sitting one day in the Columbia Law School Library doing some research for federal judge Jack Weinstein, who had been my evidence professor, and I got a call to come upstairs and the Dean of Clerkships at Columbia said, we know you wanted to go to Alaska, where I'd been hired to clerk for Jay Rabinowitz, who was on the Alaska Supreme Court, and then dishired because of my draft status or fear that I would be drafted out from under him. How would you like to go to Hawaii? What? Yes, Chief Judge Martin Pence wants a clerk beginning November 1st, 1966, November 30th, 1966. So, you know, I went down to the law library, read some opinions that Judge Pence had written, thought, well, this would be a good idea. So I said yes. And I flew to Hawaii the day after I got admitted to practice in New York on November 29th, 1966 and started with Judge Pence, clerked for him for a year, then was with High Greenstein doing drugs, draft, divorce, and other criminal activities. And, you mean uh, representing clients doing those things? Well, I wasn't doing them, but they <laughs> accused me of it. Until uh, 1970, <clears throat> when the public defender legislation was finally passed, I applied for the job, I was hired, uh, the three finalists for the job were David Shutter and Don Sukiyama. I was hired, and I quickly assembled a staff, including Captain James T. Levitt, Jr., 
who I'd met while trying court courts martial at, at uh, Pearl Harbor. Well, fantastic. Let me let me move over for just a minute. And give uh, Jim an opportunity to jump in there, since I well, saw your name come up in this as well. <clears throat> yeah, that's how I got to know Brooke, and, and maybe that's how I stayed in Hawaii because I was from the Chicago area. Although I did want to be a surfing attorney, which I, was one of the reasons that I ended up here in Hawaii. Uh, but uh, Brooke offered me a job while I was still uh, on duty with the Marine Corps. And uh, that's, so it was a pretty easy step to just stay here in Hawaii and start right off with Brooks' uh, operation that he had started up. And then you moved to, to, to become, uh, to, to move into a law firm then with him separate well, then, from the... Right, then uh, it's a very long story. I don't think we want to get into it now. But basically the legislature did not approve of the way that uh, Brooke uh, and some of us were getting off quote, these hippie criminals. Uh, Jim who, means uh, winning the cases. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't think they'd ever, I'm not going to say they never heard of a motion to suppress before, but I mean, they started, the prosecutors started getting a lot of motions on Fourth and Fifth Amendment grounds that they hadn't seen before. And I think a lot of people who, uh, you know, uh, looked to be uh, guilty of whatever crime they were charged with were getting off. And anyway, so the uh, Defender Council, which had appointed Brooke, was basically abolished uh, by the legislature. The new uh, Defender Council was, uh, in, was established, and they hired somebody else. So we just we all left, and then we had we just formed our new firm based on that. You dissolved because you did too well. Uh, I think so. I think that's that's correct, right, Brooke? Wouldn't you say so? Well. Here's what it was. In the very year that they got rid of our board of directors, and therefore me, uh, we got an award as the best public defender office in the nation. Wow. That's fantastic. <clears throat> you know, so, I did all the federal and state cases. <clears throat> and, you know, it, we really believe that the Constitution applied to the poor. So anyway, so that's how that all got started. Great. Well, I find it interesting that you know here the military and the U.S. Marine Corps brought you here. Bernie, my recollection is the military almost kept you from getting over here. That's right, Craig. Uh, Frank Paget came to Stanford and interviewed for uh, associates, and at that time Hawaii had the lowest number of lawyers per capita of any state in the United States. So they were desperate. For lawyers here and they were trying to recruit lawyers off the mainland and that was why Frank came to Stanford and interviewed and he offered me a job but because of my draft status uh, that Brooke talked about earlier I uh, I had to uh, do a stint in the Marine Corps Reserve so I had to go in for a year of training in the Marine Corps Reserves so I was a Marine like Jim was and actually they were going to fire me because I couldn't come to work immediately. When I told them I had to go to, to the Marine Corps for a year, they, uh, they threatened to fire me and then changed their mind and said, uh, come to work when you can. So that's how I came here. I came here for a couple years, and 44 years later, I'm still here. Wow. I, you know, I'm kind of amazed as I hear the stories of how you got here, but I also appreciate that the environment, the, uh, the legal environment and such that you face was probably a lot different than it was now. Um, Brooke, I'm going to jump back to you. What, what was the legal environment like when you, uh, you know, first started here in terms of the legal profession, uh, the number of practitioners? Well, I'm not sure how many they w there were. They started giving out bar numbers in something like 1964 or 5 just the year be, before I graduated, maybe maybe 66, I'm not sure. My bar number is 723. I got in 1968, and uh, Jim and, and Bernie are a couple of hundred uh, later. So, um, you know, I think there were basically a few hundred lawyers. Now, interestingly, as Bernie noted uh, early on, the lawyers per capita was uh, less than any in the nation. Now, 
we're right up there with Washington, D.C. and New York with lawyers per capita because a lot of people have realized, hey, practicing law in Hawaii can be a really fun experience. <laughs> a warm experience. <laughs> Jim, what, what can you add to that in terms of your experience coming here and practicing law? Um, I'm not sure how much, you know, things have changed. Um, I mean, I, I remember when I started out, with, when we formed our law firm, I'd never done any civil work. I'd just been doing criminal law in the uh, Judge Advocate General uh, Department of the Marine Corps. And uh, so I, I, can, I can remember when we, I first uh, filed, had a complaint to do, I didn't know who signed it. <laughs> I seriously did not. I had the client sign the complaint because <laughs> I didn't know I was supposed to sign it. So I mean, that's, that's sort of how we started off our law practice. We, none of us knew that much about civil, civil law, but there we were doing it. And didn't get into too much trouble and sort of figured it out after a while. Well, yeah, I had heard from a number of people, including you, Bernie, that, that you were sort of thrown into the fire from very early on, and, and not just in terms of uh, you know, the types of cases and such, but even the volume. I, I went right into private practice when I came here, and I was assigned over 150 cases uh, the day that I started. And like Jim said, I didn't know much about what I was doing. So I had all these 150 cases assigned to me, and some of them were further along than others. So I looked at what others had done in those cases that were farther along and tried to do that in the cases that weren't so far along. And uh, obviously, I had some real good people to learn from. Uh, Jim Kruger and uh, Frank Paget and Hod Greeley, uh, top uh, trial attorneys. So I had an opportunity to learn from them. But the volume was relentless. Okay. And I was telling you on the way over here, there were Sometimes there were letters from clients written two years earlier pleading for some information about their case. <laughs> so the volume of work was just uh, way had outstripped the number of attorneys that were available to do the work. Well, we're going to come back and talk some more about that. You're watching Hawaii's Living Legend Lawyers, brought to you by the Hawaii State Bar Association and Think Tech Hawaii. We're happy to have you. We're going to go to commercial. We'll be back in just about 30 seconds. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. I'm host of uh, Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, which is our flagship show, which plays 4 to 5 p.m. every Wednesday. And the, uh, the supporters of that show are uh, Hawaii Energy Policy Forum and uh, Hawaii Energy. And luckily enough, we have representatives of both of them right here today to tell you more about what they think about the show. Uh, Sharon Moriwaki at my left is uh, co-chair of Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, and she goes first. Sharon? Thank you. Thank you, Jay. I'm so glad that we have this Hawaii, the state of clean energy. This was uh, two years ago when we started this, and we have continued it because it's so important, and there's so many developments happening across the state. And we hope you'll tune in every Wednesday, 4 to 5. It's wonderful. And uh, Ray is uh, Hawaii Energy. Ray, what is your thought about the same subject? Well, I, I agree completely with Sharon uh, that uh, we are talking about every Wednesday, 4 to 5, uh, we talk about some of the most important subjects that uh, are affecting the islands uh, now and into the future. Uh, energy, clean energy, we need it. Uh, we often run into uh, new ideas that we had not uh, thought about before. Uh, we did just today, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I think we're going to have more of that uh, in the future. So. Uh, come on down and, uh, and watch us uh, 4 to 5 on Wednesdays, um, and we'll uh, see what happens. We'll see you then. Aloha. Aloha. I have an observation about well, welcome back. face that you might want to hear about. Okay. I think, I think we've got an observation, but I, first I want to welcome everybody back to Hawaii's Living Legend Lawyers, brought to you by the Hawaii State Bar Association, <laughs> part of our 3D series, and this particular episode is, is called Building a Practice and Building a Life. And uh, we have three panelists with us. We have Jim Levitt, Bernie Bays, and on Skype we have Brooke Hart. And Brooke, you were just mentioning you had a, an interesting uh, story to tell us about, for, presumably about the legal profession, and we look forward to hearing it, hopefully. <laughs> well, you know, we were talking about how we got started and what mattered. And I think it, it's, it's important to Hawaii that our 
fathers, our older lawyers, our those who served in the Second World War, and particularly in the 442nd Battalion, and became the leaders of our state, had experienced enormous prejudice. And for the first time, they were in positions of power, and particularly a number who became judges. And this was at the time that the Warren Court's decisions on individual rights were featured in our jurisprudence. And I think those who came back from World War II and from the experience of having been uh, rejected because of their racial background, their color, their, their uh, heritage, embraced the Warren Court's decisions. And that meant a great deal to the development of individual rights law in Hawaii. And Jim and I and Bernie were kind of in the forefront of the young lawyers who were applying those precedents in Hawaii law. See, and that must have been an exciting time to be involved in law, particularly mm -hmm. if you had an interest and a passion for those areas. Jim, what do you remember about that? Uh, no, I was just thinking when Brooke was talking about start, starting up the law practice and all that, though, it, this is, there's nothing, no, no idealism connected with it. I was just thinking when we started, we would make a run over to the Salvation Army every now and then to outfit our office with the furniture that we used. I mean, we had, we had very little <laughs> to, to buy furniture with, so that's what we did. We, I think we were using uh, bagasse boards for our, for separators between our desks, so that, so that we could carry on with clients. I don't know if Brooke remembers that, but it was well. Not was, only do I remember it, but I went to the Salvation Army, and I found this beautiful desk that was dated maybe 1935, and I bought it, and it's my desk today. It's been recovered a few times in a little bit more attractive wood, but it's a beautiful and unusual desk, and it sits in my office on Queen Street at this moment. All right. <laughs> That's Bernie, loyalty. That is loyalty. <laughs> Bernie, what, what do you recall from that time, or, or, you know, as you started out your practice here in terms of uh, challenges you might have faced, whether they were fiscal or otherwise? It, it was an exciting time. Uh, this place was smoking in terms of the amount of legal activity. Uh, people had just started uh, filing personal injury cases. Uh, up until that time, people here sort of had the view that when you were injured, you should just suck it up. Uh, but in the late 60s, early 70s, people began to embrace the idea of recovering for injuries and in losses. And Paget Greeley did primarily plaintiff's personal injury work. And we began to get a lot more traction. We had an office on Maui, an office here on Oahu, and for a short time, one on Kauai. And we began to get larger and larger verdicts in those cases. Well, so, I, I wanted to see a picture, of, a picture of you back from that time. Do we have that? We can put that up? Was that sitting at your desk there? And yes. Oh, boy. I was younger then, Jim. There was a, and, and you had more facial hair at that time. You know, there's a lot more hair back in those days all over the place. <laughs> all over, well. Well, I, I didn't have I think we have some photos of Brooke, uh, don't we? And, and we do. I had some, but yeah, it look was at that. going quickly. What is, it, what is this photo, Brooke? Can you explain what the people okay, that are standing there with you? Show me the photo. Because I can't, can't see Okay, the, I can. I, no, Jim, can you uh, help out with this? Left, left to right, it's Bill Hunt, Dave Hall, myself, I think, and Brooke. Uh, back when there, like I say, there's a lot more hair around everywhere. Yep, this is back around 1970 or so, yes? 72, I'd guess. I, I put that at Well, the, when the firm started, Bill Hunt had not quite yet graduated from Columbia. And I think he joined us in 1973 or four. No, no, he was through the year before that, I think. No, I don't, I, okay, I don't know right. what okay. picture you're looking at. 73, 73, right. yeah, I'll give you 73. 73. So, 
you know, he, he started as an associate. He became a partner. Sherwood went off to become the deputy general counsel of the Sierra Club and saved the redwood trees and the palila bird. He retired last <clears throat> year from the Earth Justice Foundation. Okay. David at this Hall, point, I think we need to interject the fact that uh, when uh, Mike was saving the palila bird uh, and they had a federal, a federal case, uh, to establish the right of the palila bird. He had a stuffed palila bird on the council table as his client. That's right. And Judge <laughs> King recognized, Judge Samuel P. King, one of the great judges in our country, yeah. recognized that the bird could be the plaintiff. That's fantastic. Well, that's a perfect lead into my next question. And, and Brooke, I'm going to start with you because I know that there are a number of them, but can you pick out at least one? A, a seminal case for you uh, that you know that helped define you as an attorney and helped uh, uh, launch your career even further than you'd, you'd gotten at that point. Well, that's really hard. There were a number of cases, but the one that I think about as falling into that category involved my defense of a young Navy uh, uh, seaman. Uh, whose name was Butch Drury, Eudor Drury, who was, it could have been Johnny Appleseed in the movie, who had red cheeks and a big smile and was very much against the war in Vietnam. Let's make it clear and that I wasn't the prosecutor. In that you case. were not the prosecutor. Okay, right. okay keep and, going. And Drury had, had found himself in the military as a result of an unusual situation, hailing from Missouri. He'd, he'd, uh, been forced by his father if he wanted to go to college. He had to go to the military academy at Annapolis. And when he got there, he realized he didn't want to kill anybody. So he washed out. And if you wash out at Annapolis, you get put in a reserve unit. And he got put in a reserve unit. He got called up. And <coughs> suddenly, he found himself both a member of the community at Church of the Crossroads, which was a strong anti-war community, and with orders to go to Vietnam on the battleship the next morning. And he came into my office and he said, okay, I don't want to go. What are you going to do about it? I said, you know, it's like at 6 o'clock. <coughs> the, 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 the boat's supposed to leave at, at 9 in the morning. And he just stood there and looked at me. So I said, well, I guess we could try. So I found my secretary. He was down in the Bank of Hawaii making a deposit. I said, come back, please. We've got some work to do. And we worked until about 2 in the morning, drafting a petition for writ of habeas corpus and a motion for a temporary restraining order and to stop the battleship from sailing with jury on it. And I called Nils Tavares, our other federal judge at the time at home. I said, Judge Tavares, will you come in early and hear a petition for a temporary <coughs> restraining order? And he said, yes. So at 7 o'clock, we met at his office, and Tiny, Ed Burke's father, was the bailiff. Tiny wasn't too happy. He was a former naval, naval veteran. And uh, we sat before Judge Tavares. Remember, Jimmy had those, and Bernie, you probably remember, too. He had those little three seats in the front and three seats in the back like it was school. And we sat there. It's called the three-judge court. Yeah, you remember that? That was called the three-judge court. Okay. Oh, well, uh, Yoshimi Hayashi came over. He was the U.S. attorney, eventually went on to Supreme Court, and argued hard why this petition should not be granted and why the restraining order should be denied. Jury hit down the hallway because he was planning to run away. He wasn't going to go on the battleship. The case is called Jury versus Loudermilk. At about 7.45, the sun came out, and a ray of sun came into Judge Tavares' chambers. And as it did, he looked up and he said, I think I have to grant this. So he signed the petition for a temporary restraining order and ordered that the battleship not leave without discharging jury first. And then the question was whether we could get it to Pearl Harbor by 9 o'clock, because that's when the ship was leaving. And I ran down the hall with Walter Chen, who was the chief clerk. He filed the papers, and Drury and I jumped into my Volkswagen, 
and we drove to Pearl, which now might be fairly quick unless you re reach some of the traffic they have for you out there. But in those days, they were building the highway. So it was a question whether we could make it. All the lights were green. We got to Dockside at four minutes to nine. And I went up to the, to the, to the mate who was in charge of the gangplank and said, may I see the captain, please? I have a petition to file to serve on him. And they brought Captain Loudermilk down there and we served him at two minutes to nine and Drury was saved from going to Vietnam. Wow. He was later prosecuted for being out of uniform when he wore a peace symbol. He was acquitted of that and also failing to shave. But the naval regulations permitted him to wear a neatly trimmed beard. So the end result of the, that was he was released from the military as a conscientious objector. I got a letter from him about six years ago and a book he wrote about this experience. You know, uh, that's funny because uh, the, the, you just jogged my memory about something I'd forgotten. Because we were, it seems like we were always filing writs of mandamus and routine. So I remember one morning Brooke, Brooke called me and we had to go and get Judge Heen's signature on some important, <laughs> you know, restraining order or whatever it was. And I had to paddle out to... Uh, Pops or canoes, wherever Judge Heen was surfing. <laughs> I, to give I, it forget, to I forget if I had him sign it out there or we had him right. paddle uh, back in to sign it. Yeah. But he was very good natured about it and we did it. Well, Walter what was a, a great judge. Was a wonderful well, we got to move to another right. commercial here. So let me do that. We're going to come back and I, I want to hear a few more stories on this side of the, uh, of the Skype camera. You're listening to uh, the Hawaii State Bar Association's Living Legend Lawyers and our discussions with Jim Levitt, Bernie Bays, and Brooke Hart. We'll be back. Aloha, my name is Kenneth Lawson. I'm your host here at Life in the Law. I'm really interested in law as I practiced it for 18 years before coming to Hawaii. I practiced criminal law and civil rights law on the mainland. Now I teach law at the University of Hawaii Law School, William S. Richardson School of Law. And I bring in guests who are very current on legal issues that affect your life here in Hawaii. Uh, come and join me every Wednesday at 1 p.m. as we explore how the law affects you, how the law is changing, and why it's important that you should care about what's going on in your community. See you then. Here in the country. And we're back with the Living Legend Lawyers and Building a Practice, Building a Life, brought to you by the Hawaii State Bar Associations, where we're talking about experiences uh, building a law practice, a law firm, and trying to balance that uh, demanding law career with your life. Um, we've been talking a little bit with Jim Levitt, with um, Brooke Hart, and also with my law partner, Bernie Bays. And Bernie, I wanted to ask you, we were talking some uh, before the break about uh, seminal decision or cases and such. Tell us a little bit about a, a case like that for you. Well, like Brooke, it's difficult to select one case, but I guess it would be the Lease Rent uh, Renegotiation Relief Act uh, test case that uh, was decided in 1978. Uh, that decision uh, went against Bishop Estate and actually found that they were participating in an oligopoly uh, with the other large landowners and made a bunch of findings that were very detrimental to them. So and I think you were that on the was, plaintiff's side on that. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> That was a, I, I think that was a, a seminal case, but unfortunately it kind of had the effect of waking, awakening a giant. So uh, Kamehameha Schools, Bishop of State, began to take a whole bunch of steps to improve their position, both legally and politically, that uh, became very difficult for us to counterbalance. And I spent about 10 years on a whole series of cases and jury trials uh, involved in uh, fee conversions and things like that, probably represented about 20 or 30,000 uh, clients in doing that. And that uh, probably took about 10 years <laughs> off my life, that 10 years. 10 years of it and 10 years that. off it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right, that's right. That took about 10 years from the mid, I think I started representing the first group in about 1986, uh, and we went up until uh, uh, 1976 and went up till about 1985 doing that. Uh, so that was 10 years. Well, 
you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, we, we throw out this term, the, you know, the living legend lawyers of Hawaii and such, and yet the reason that we have uh, the three of you with us is not just because you managed to live long enough to, to, to stay alive with three digits in your bar number, but also, is also because of the reputation that you've made for yourself, not just as professionals in, uh, in the legal profession, but also because uh, of the kind of people that you are and the respect that you've gained uh, you know, throughout uh, our profession, both among those that practiced early on with you and those of us that uh, you know, have learned have come into the practice much later and had a chance to get to know you and work with you. Thank you. One of the challenges is, is you know, for every lawyer coming into the practice is learning to try and, and balance practicing law with having some kind of life. And we've talked about building a practice and building a life uh, as the title of today's show. That's almost become a moniker for a young generation. What's, what's my work-life balance going to be? And most uh, of those who practice for some time, I think, feel that that's a, a, you know, that moniker is getting away from the importance of, of, of a, a concentrating on building yourself as an attorney. But Jim, I want to start with you. What, what do you think about, what have you done throughout your career to try and balance both your life and your professional career? It is, it is hard to, uh, to do that balance. And I must say that if you want to really uh, achieve something and be successful, you are going to have to put a lot of your, a lot of that balance is going to be heavily weighted towards practicing law and, and just getting it right, figuring out because I mean, perseverance and, uh, and grit is a big part of what uh, uh, what's part of success in the law practice. So um, unfortunately, you know, I don't, I don't know that I'm a role model, and I don't know any of us are role models for having this perfect, nice work-life balance that is. You know, supposedly uh, achievable. Uh, maybe, maybe it is, but you may have to give up something for that too if you want it. Well, I think that's that, that's a fair comment, Bernie. What? I could tell you a story that might demonstrate that work-life balance. Uh, one time, I went out in the living room in about uh, mid-April, and uh, I noticed something. I turned around, and it was the Christmas tree that was still there with ornaments hanging <laughs> off of it. And I hadn't been in the living room since <laughs> December. So that kind of gives you an idea about the work-life balance I had at times during my life. Brooke, was it, did you have similar experiences with that? <laughs> I don't see it. I don't see a Christmas tree back there. Well, you know. <laughs> you wouldn't see it anyway. If it was Hanukkah time, you'd probably see some, some semblance the of Hanukkah boy. celebration. But here's the thing. This is, this is one of the most difficult challenges for lawyers who are busy and involved in their practices because the client always comes first except your family needs to come first now Jim who I know you know like a brother and I've loved Bernie for many years but I never practiced law with him but you know I was the best man at Jim's wedding and I loved Jim's wife who was a wonderful person and I know his daughters and he he did that balance pretty damn well. If I go out of the room and I go in the kitchen, two of my wives will be in the kitchen. They're in there now. And another one will be arriving tomorrow. And several children will arrive from both marriages. And my the woman I've been with for 23 years, we don't have children, but she's like the third mother. So, you know, it's kind of all worked out. We're all together. But it's been challenging because when you yep. look at the commitment you make to a client who has uh, his or her life on the line, that always has to come first. And sometimes it's difficult to balance with your commitments to your family. Well, I can appreciate that. Hey, I wanted to get a chance to put up a picture. We haven't had to see the picture yet uh, of Jim, have we? We had a picture with Jim in it as well? Yeah, I was, I think I was. Oh, yeah, you, in, you were in, in the other one. one. Okay. I was in that one. There oh. oh, and here's another one. Brooke, I, I don't know if, the, if you can see this, but this is a picture of you, and, and maybe you can tell us some about what yeah. happened. This is in 1984, and it is uh, you with Henry Hui Hui, uh, Hui Hui, and uh, the, the, he was just been acquitted, as I understand it, for exoneration. Is that? Well, that's right. That was one of the more extraordinary trials. 
Henry was, along with Nappy Pulava, Alama Leota, Alvin Ka'ohu, and Bobby Wilson, said to be among the leaders of Hawaii's organized crime. This is the, the newspaper called them the gang that couldn't shoot straight. And we had over a decade of trials back to back, this being the latest one in 1984, when Henry was charged with extortion. And he was acquitted by a jury. And the facts were he went on the job site, which ironically was the federal court building, and he told a man named Gushikin, hey, you could get hurt on the job. And what Henry was saying was, watch out, Gushikin. These guys walking around with rebar, if you don't watch what you're doing, you can get injured. <laughs> but what Gushikin heard of was course. he was being extorted. <laughs> you could get hurt on it. So what I did in final argument was, the Godfather was kind of popular at the time. I just put some Kleenex in my mouth and played it for the jury. And they cracked up, of course, and Henry was acquitted. And that's what was going on there. We had just come out of the courthouse, which is the Supreme Court building. We were on the Mackay side. Now it's the Supreme Court building, but it was the circuit court then. All right. <laughs> well, hey, all of you are litigators, and I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, a good litigator would never ask a question they don't already know the answer to it. And I don't know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. And Bernie, I'm going to start with you. you know, knowing what you know now, what you've been through throughout your career, all the tough times, the challenges, and everything else, but also all the success, would you go back and do it again? Would you stay in, in the practice of law, or would you pick another path? I think the practice of law is still an opportunity to make a decent living and gives you an opportunity to help people. And I think the opportunity to do a decent living in a respected profession where you get the opportunity to, to help people is becoming more and more rare these days. And I think the practice of law still today offers that opportunity. Uh, I'm not sure you're going to get rich, although uh, plaintiff's personal injury attorneys like Jim have been very successful. Uh, but I think you're going to make a good living, and it gives you an opportunity to help people and maybe make a difference. Uh, like, I'd like to hope that I made a difference in those uh, lease rent cases and in all the fee conversions that we did for the uh, single-family lessees and condo lessees. So I'd like to think I accomplished something there. So I think it, it combines an opportunity to, to help people, to make a difference, and to still make a, a decent, fair living. How about you, Jim? Would you go back and do it again? You were saying if, if I knew then what I know now? That's right. I, I would have bought Microsoft stock. And just <laughs> the, the, uh, no, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very uh, content with the, uh, with the practice that uh, we, we built. And uh, I do enjoy getting up in the morning and going and helping people. I interact with, you know, as they say, real people. They yeah. have real problems. and. Uh, uh, Hopefully, at the end of the representation, they thank me and, and go on uh, to, a, to a life that's a little bit better because yeah. of my uh, involvement with them. Great. Brooke, similar sentiments, or you take a different path? Well, look, the work we do is never boring. And we're actually able to see the results that's of right. our efforts, if we do the job properly, in advancing somebody else's life in a positive way. So I have to say, well, I might have changed this or that or made this decision or that decision a little differently. I would do it all over again and continue to do it to this day. And I have no reason to stop at this point. We're very fortunate to have had the educational opportunities that the three of us have had. We're very fortunate to be in a position to have the important advantage you have when you have a law license and we should never forget our good fortune. We have just a few minutes left and I, I'd like to take this opportunity first of all to thank you again for coming and being on the show and, and, and giving your thoughts and your impressions. If you were talking to a young attorney now, someone just starting out coming into the practice of law, short, sweet, what would you tell them? Ernie? I think I would tell them probably to do a little better job than I probably did in seeking that uh, uh, life balance between your work life and your personal life. 
I probably weighted my life much too much uh, heavily on the work side. I had things that I wanted to accomplish, uh, both for our law firm now and firms that I was with earlier. I devoted a lot of work and a lot of time to that. I probably would do a better job of that. And I think, uh, I think younger people today are doing a better job of seeking a, a more appropriate balance between their work life and their personal life. Jim? Um, okay, without, uh, I, I agree with uh, what Bernie has said. The, the other thing I would say, though, is don't neglect yourself. Uh, take care of yourself because that's all you got. And uh, you need to uh, you know, work out, uh, stay, in, stay in shape and all that uh, because if, if you lose that, you're going to have a problem practicing law. And I know you work out at Clark Hat. You're also a surfer, right? Yep. yep. As are you, Bernie. Yes. Jim and I actually uh, made the finals of the Lawyers Long Board uh, uh, National Championship uh, about four years ago. I think I've seen that picture. <laughs> Brooke, let me give you a minute to, a few comments to our young lawyers. Well, I always believed that if you didn't take care of yourself, you couldn't provide the excellent service that you were committed to. So, you know, I swam for 20 years at Ala Moana. But the problem was I didn't use sunscreen early enough. And, and the result is I kind of look like a leopard. I, rode, I ride my bicycle every day in the mountains in Manoa and try to stay in good condition. The most important thing I tell young lawyers is, look, don't embrace this profession unless you're prepared to commit yourself to quality work that isn't done until it's finished. I like that. Are there any concerns that any of you have had about uh, our practice of law in terms of uh, you know, civility as, as the profession has grown both in number and, and, uh, and the kinds of cases and such? I think that. Mm -hmm. Well, we're, I, don't, I don't know if uh, it's, it's hard to quantify it, I think, because uh, it, and it's sort of an individual thing with. Uh, yeah, I don't see much uh, reduction in the level of civility, which has always been here in Hawaii. I think it's a very collegial type of a, of a bar that you don't see and you hear about other cities. You go, wow, that's, that's not Hawaii. And I, I'm very glad that we, we have this ethos here. This old, Really, it is an aloha spirit that you have, even if you're adverse to the other party. You know, you're adverse, of course, but... You know, it's, it's not uh, uh, scorched earth at all. Yeah. I think, Craig, one thing, uh, I, I agree with Jim on the civility. I, I think I have noticed a, a decline in the level of integrity that you see among lawyers and the level of honesty that they, uh, that they demonstrate. Uh, I think that is a concern. and It, it worries me a lot. I've seen a lot of things, uh, people, uh, making misrepresentations to judges, uh, misrepresentations to each other. Uh, so that decline in the level, general level of integrity uh, concerns me, and I think there's definitely a trend in that direction. Brooke, have you had any experience in that regard? Well, we had a lot in the early years. I remember a federal prosecutor who Judge King took to the cleaners because he lied to the grand jury. And it's a, it's a famous case called United States versus Samango, both in the District Court and the Court of Appeals. That prosecutor's no longer with us, at least professionally. Uh, there are always a few stinkers, and it's unfortunate when you have to deal with them. But my view of it is, okay, if we can't settle this matter in a collegial way to the benefit of both of our clients, I'll see you at the courthouse and then we'll let the truth prevail. I think that's a good way to handle that. Well, with that, I want to thank you again. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being a part of it. And, and you know, I, I'm still putting on my, my hat as a 2013 uh, president of the bar to say thank you for being a part of our profession. I, I think we're honored by having great practitioners like you and, and great examples like each of you. And, uh, with that, it, this has been, uh, you know, Hawaii State Bar Association's Living Legend Lawyers with Jim Levitt, Bernie Bays, and Brooke Hart.
building a practice and building a life. I'm Craig Wagner, that served as host, and it's been our pleasure to bring this to you. Thank you for being here.